Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons and Dragons. Join the Patreon for these character sheets and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe for a new game next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Jack and Daxter from the Jack and Daxter series, a set of games I was the perfect age for. The first game came out when I just wanted a fun 3D platformer with nice colors and challenges I could spend entire weeks desperately flailing at with my seven-year-old hand-eye coordination. It was perfect. Then Jack 2 came out when I was nine and I was like, yeah, guns, swearing. I'm a grown-up now. I'm basically 10. Now that I am a grown-up now, I just want another 3D platformer. Please stop giving everyone guns. Uh, hey. hey, I need information. You're gonna give it to me now. Sorry, it's chill. Come man. on! What happened to your voice? What do you mean, what happened to my voice? Let's start off with Jack because I know everyone only cares about the Daxter build and I'm gonna hold on to that watch time, baby. First, we need to go on an eco trip with all the magical powers of the Earth's magic channeling through us. Next, we need a gun, except instead of shooting bullets, it shoots various different types of ammunition with special properties. I'm saying it's a spellcasting focus and especially when you consider it uses eco, yeah, it's a spellcasting focus. People got mad at the Doom Guy video for the same reason, but do you really want me to just say gunner feet and ignore all the weapon's special properties? I hope not, that's terrible. Finally, we need to be your angle or your devil with light and dark eco, which I'm counting as a different goal than normal eco because it's really different in the game. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Charisma will be number one. Everyone loves Jack in the Precursor Legacy, and everyone fears Edgelord Jack in two and three. Dexterity next, you don't really wear armor and you use a lot of guns. Ours are going to use charisma, but you can still have dexterity. Strength after that, jumping and unarmed fighting are both strength-based, that's sort of all you do in the Precursor Legacy. Boom, we've built Jack 1 Jack. Follow that up with Constitution. Some people figuratively put the team on their back, but you literally do that. If you die, Daxter isn't getting out on his own. Wisdom is a bit low. You don't really resist the Dark Eco. You kind of just let the hate flow through you. We're going to dump Intelligence, though. You don't know any of the lore until it's explained to you, which makes you a great surrogate for the audience, but doesn't really help you take agency in your own story. Jack is just a human who gets warped through time and possessed with evil and holy magic, but the base is still human. He's like Monkey bread you could go sweet or savory with the same base dome for that base though we're gonna grab the fighting initiate feat for unarmed fighting a fighting style to fight unarmed dealing 1d6 bludgeoning damage with an unarmed attack or 1d8 when you have two free hands when you spin around you can also deal a d4 of damage to a creature you have grappled once per round i don't think jack does any grappling though maybe in playstation network all-stars battle royale but nobody remembers that bump your strength and charisma with your two free points take perception for your skill of choice and the athlete background for athletics and acrobatics wow we already built Precursor Legacy Jack at level 1. How much more complicated could he get in Jack 2 and 3? Oh, oh, oh shoot. Oh, that's a lot. Let's start off with Edgy Jack. Warlock is probably the edgiest class, maybe Rogue, but I'm gonna say Warlock because that'll give you two skills from the Warlock list, like Intimidation and Deception, to get spooky and to get smarmy. Hexblade Warlock will work best for you, giving you Hexblade's Curse to absolutely destroy one creature for a minute. You get to add your proficiency bonus to the damage of attacks against them, critically hit them on a 19 or a 20. You can heal your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier when you kill them, making them drop some of that green eco. You also get spells and cantrips, and I'll be real, some of the abilities we get will be out of order. Or you get light eco abilities from the dark subclass, vice versa. The good thing is, it's all on the same sheet, so you can just say it's coming out of different places. Anyway, for a light shield, cast shield to add 5 to your AC as a reaction to keep the damage off. Arms of Hadar will be a nice darkness blast, forcing a strength saving throw on creatures within 10 feet of you, dealing 2d6 necrotic damage to those that fail, and preventing them from taking reactions until the start of their next turn. Honestly, they're probably just dumbfounded by how badass you look. For your cantrips, Eldritch Blast is a nice basic flavor beam. The deal 1d10 force damage for a little yellow eco bullet. Thunderclap forces a constitution saving throw on creatures within 5 feet of you, dealing a d6 of thunder damage to those that fail for the red eco shotgun blast. Second level warlocks get infusion, special abilities from embracing the everlasting darkness. Sorry, my jack 2 data is stored on the same memory card as the kingdom hearts, they bleed together a little bit. Grab agonizing blast to add your charisma modifier to the damage of your eldritch blast attacks, that yellow eco gun is always my favorite, it's just simple and clean, that's the kingdom hearts again. Armor of shadows will let you cast mage armor at will, giving you an AC of 13 plus your dexterity modifier, but more importantly, making you put out a spooky evil aura. For this level spell, Witch Bolt is a ranged spell attack that deals 1d12 lightning damage and keeps dealing that damage automatically every round. You stay in range as long as you hold concentration. It's a nice way to pick yourself up if you're feeling blue. Eco. Third level warlocks get a packed option, a little gift for being experimented on like a human hamster, which is funny because you're friends with a human hamster. Packed to the blade lets you conjure a weapon to yourself that's magical in terms of overcoming resistances 
because it has to be a melee weapon for now, but we can fix that up soon enough to make it more gunny. For this level spell, Shatter creates a shockwave in a 10 foot radius, forcing a constitution saving throw on creatures inside, dealing 3d8 thunder damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. Inorganic materials and structures have disadvantage on this save, so it should be great on metal heads. I think it's a bomb. It's a dark bomb. Fourth level warlocks get another ability score improvement. Charisma is the most important. That's how we use all of our eco, including the eco in our gun and the eco in our dolphin. For this level spell, invisibility makes you invisible for up to an hour, depending on your concentration, or if you make an attack or cast a spell. Obviously, you couldn't have this until Jack 3, or you would just skip the security drone chase thing. God, I hate the security drone chase thing. Fifth level warlocks get another invocation. Improved packed weapon will give you plus one to the attack and damage rolls with your packed weapon. You can use it as a spell casting focus, and it can take the shape of a light or heavy crossbow. So now you can actually shoot the shockwave out of your gun. It works so dang good for the morph gun. I am really good at this. I am really proud of this one. You also learn third level spells. Spirit Shroud lets you add a D8 of necrotic, radiant, or cool damage to your attacks against creatures within 10 feet of you and slows creatures down as well. So it can be the light eco or the dark eco, whatever you need. We'll bounce over to Sorcerer now, specifically a Divine Soul Sorcerer, your good guy after all. That will make you favored by the precursors or favored by the gods for the graphic. Letting you add 2d4 to a failed attack roll or saving throw once per long rest. No, 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 no. That's not quite how it happened. I think this game is also on the same memory card as my Prince of Persia save file. You also get spells and cantrips. Firebolt shoots a ranged spell attack that deals 2d10 fire damage for some more yellow eco. Lightning Lure forces a strength saving throw on a creature, bringing them 10 feet closer to you if they fail, and dealing 2d8 lightning damage if they end their turn within 5 feet of you, though the blue eco morph gun wasn't really my thing. Sacred Flame forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures, dealing 2d8 radiant damage if they fail, and you can ignore cover so it's a laser that bounces around corners finally create bonfire creates a five foot cube of fire that deals 2d8 fire damage to those that fail if you'd prefer to make an area of effect instead of shooting a spell attack for first level spells magic missile shoots out three darts that home in on one target and automatically hit them for 1d4 plus one force damage each spirit shroud would add extra damage to that within 10 feet of you so these pair really well together for some consistent damage thunder wave forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot cube dealing 2d8 thunder damage to those that fail and pushing them back 10 feet as well half damage and no pushing if they succeed for a very basic red eco shotgun. Multiclassing another spellcaster with Warlock isn't actually all that stressful. You basically have the same amount of spell slots you would have if you didn't multiclass from each class, and you cast Warlock spells with Sorcerer slots and vice versa. Second level Sorcerers get a font of magic with sorcery points you can use to recover spell slots or something later, but that's a secret. For this level spell, Feather Fall prevents up to five falling creatures from taking falling damage, so you can do the light glidey thingy and also save people while falling. I'm talking Daxter, Ratchet, Fat Princess, Bioshock Daddy, um, the skeleton skeleton guy from that game. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Third level sorcerers get meta magic, letting you spend your sorcery points to augment your spells. Quickened spell lets you blast away with a spell that would normally take an action to cast as a bonus action, so you can use two eldritch blasts for rapid fire. Heightened spell gives creatures disadvantage on saving throws against spells you cast, so your shotgun will really blow people up. For this level spell, alter self lets you give yourself a natural weapon that deals 1d6 damage and has plus one to attack and damage rolls for some dark jack claws. It also lets you give yourself kills or change your appearance, but I just need claws. Fourth level sorcerers get another ability score improvement cap off your charisma to make everything you do better for this level spell enlarge reduce makes a creature larger gives them advantage on strength checks and saves and an extra d4 of damage to their attacks with weapons it can be great for stopping people from running away but otherwise there are better uses for your concentration than becoming big jack you can also use it to make people smaller but jack doesn't do that so don't do that fifth level sorcerers get third level spells fireball forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 10 foot radius sphere dealing 8d6 fire damage to those that fail who doesn't love a grenade launcher sixth level holy solis get empowered healing letting you spend sorcery points to let someone re-roll healing die when they do so using your reaction. So we might as well grab Cure Wounds to heal 1d8 plus your Charisma modifier as an action, giving you green eco that you can use, or light eco. Honestly, light eco kind of steps on green eco's toes a lot. Seventh level sorcerers can learn fourth level spells. Stone skin is going to be the closest we get to invincibility, giving a creature resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for an hour depending on your concentration. Invulnerability is a ninth level spell, and it's only for wizards. Jack isn't smart enough to be a wizard. Guess we could go bard, but every time I make a bard, people poop their pants. Some of the people have roommates. I don't want those roommates to smell those poopies. Eighth level sorcerers get another ability score improvement. Might as well bump that constitution for better concentration and more HP. We don't really need any physical stats since you're using charisma for all your weapons anyway. For this level spell, spiritual weapon is a second level spell that summons a weapon to attack for you on your bonus action, dealing 1d8 plus your charisma modifier in force damage if you just want to shoot a little disc to shoot while you shoot something else. Ninth level sorcerers can learn fifth level spells, but I don't need any of these. Grab slow instead, forcing a 
wisdom saving throw on six creatures, having their movement speed, giving them a negative two penalty to their AC and dexterity saving throws, and they can't use reactions and have to choose between actions or bonus actions on their spell. Additionally, if they cast a spell, roll a d20. On an 11 or higher, they have to wait until the next round to cast it. This all lasts for a minute, depending on your concentration, and pairs really well with Fireball. It's easier to hit people when they can't run away. Who knew? 10th level sorcerers get another meta magic option. Empowered spell lets you reroll damage die on spells you cast, an amount equal to your charisma modifier. You don't need careful spell. Friendly fire isn't an issue when it's just you and your weasel friend doing all the work. For this level spell, Lightning Bolt forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 100 foot line, dealing 8d6 lightning damage to those that fail and half as much to those that succeed. It's like Fireball, but for people who form a conga line. 11th level sorcerers learn 6th level spells. Chain Lightning is a bigger version of Lightning Bolt, forcing a dexterity saving throw on a creature within 90 feet of you and up to three targets within 30 feet of them, dealing 10d8 lightning damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. One good hit deserves another, or two more, and a racing game. 12th level sorcerers get another ability score improvement, push your constitution modifier higher, you have a lot of casting levels, and that's just not going to get you that rugged adventurer's amount of hit points you should have. 13th level sorcerers can learn 7th level spells. Delayed Blast Fireball creates a bead that gradually grows in power. If you shoot it off right away, deals 12d6 fire damage to creatures that fail the dexterity saving throw in a 20 foot radius sphere, but it gains an extra d6 of fire damage every round, you charge it up for a minute, depending on your concentration. That means potentially 22 d6 fire damage, which ought to turn the metalheads into metal deads. 14th level divine soul sorcerers get angelic form, giving you wings and a flying speed. You don't really fly, you just sort of fall with style. But you can steal motorcycles that fly, or use cool hoverboards to stay off the ground. Nobody said you had to fly very high, you could just use it to avoid ground hazards. Our capstone is the 15th level of sorcerer for an 8th level spell, but I really just want regenerate from the 7th level, healing 4d8 plus 15 HP instantly, and another 1 HP every round after you hit that for an hour, no concentration required, helping you keep the little HP you have pretty high. Now that we've got level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you have a ton of damage variety and spell shape variety to hit people where you need to. You've also got some great mobility with flying speed to make platforming challenges less troublesome. Finally, 7th level Spirit Shroud, Agonizing Blast, and Hexblade's Curse come together to make each shot with your yellow eco gun deal 1d10 plus 3d8 plus 11 damage, and a quickened spell lets you shoot Eldritch Blasts twice per round for 8d10 plus 24d8 plus 88 damage in one turn, or around 224 with median rolls if you would like to delete a boss. For weaknesses, your AC isn't all that great, with your best option being medium armor and 17 total. It's not terrible, but you've also got mediocre HP, so that's a bad combo. You're also lacking intelligence, so illusions could be a big issue, as could feeble minds, since everything you do is a spell. Finally, charisma is really your only good stat, so skill checks could be rough. Thankfully, most problems can be solved with shooting stuff or unleashing dark powers. Besides, we all know who the real brains of the operation is. I am Weasel! Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to be PlayStation portable, being small enough to sneak around. Next, we need some extermination equipment, which might be useful to kill bugs, but could probably also work on bigger creatures. Turns out roach poison is also human poison. They could just call it poison. Finally, we need to make sure that we're great at running away. Your best combat option is to bail and find Jack. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep those multi-classing minimums in mind. Dexterity will be number one. When you're small, your best bet is to hide and get the cheap shots in. Intelligence after that, operating dangerous chemicals and flamethrowers requires a bit of tech skill, or at least it does if you want to do it safely. Charisma next, you might not be the best at talking, but you do talk a lot, so if you throw enough poop at the wall, some of it's bound to stick. Wisdom after that, I'm sure otzels have sharp senses, they're like otters and weasels. Constitution is a bit low, you're a tiny guy and will drop strength, like I said, tiny guy. You don't even do your own walking most of the time. Perengon was added in the Witch Beyond the Wild Light, which is great, except I wrote this script in June initially, so uh, had to update it real quick. You have plus two to one stat and plus one to another, bump your dexterity and your charisma, those are two good things. Your lucky footwork lets you add a d4 to a dexterity saving throw as a reaction, though your dexterity saving throws were already going to be pretty great. Rabbit Hop lets you jump a number of feet equal to five times your proficiency bonus as a bonus action, an amount of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus to get where you need to go. To get to the jump on people in combat, use hair trigger to add your proficiency bonus to your initiative rolls. Your first round could be you running away. There's no reason to attack people necessarily. Rabbits get perception for free, and you get two more skills from your background, like performance and arcana, to talk too much at bars and get intimately familiar with the eco's effects on the human body. We'll start off as a rogue because you're a little rap scallion at the end of the day, giving you four skills like stealth, acrobatics, sleight of hand, and deception. You have expertise in two of those skills, letting you double your proficiency bonus with those skills, like stealth and acrobatics to sneak away and 
and avoid getting grappled. Sneak Attack gives you an extra d6 of damage when you attack a creature with advantage or have an ally within 5 feet of the target, as long as you're using a finesse or ranged weapon, which unfortunately, Daxter doesn't do. Maybe he should get a gun. Weirdly, Daxter isn't going to be the best combatant. But at level 2, a rogue, he can start doing his own thing a little better, with cunning action letting you dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. His thing is being a coward. Third level rogues can choose a roguish archetype, and Thief will suit our little coward best. You get second story work, letting you climb just as fast as you run, scurrying up walls like a little squirrel. It will also make you as fast on walls as you are with your hands, with your fast hands, letting you use an object or pick a lock with your bonus action as well. Depending on what type of magical items are out there in your DM's world, this could be very powerful, or not regularly useful. Depends on the DM. Your sneak attack also bumps up to 2d6 if you want Daxter to have a knife. Fourth level rogues get an ability score improvement, bump your dexterity modifier so you could be even sneakier. You could just hide inside Jack's sleep if you wanted to. But what if Jack got kidnapped by future cops? Then you'd have to get Jack back by killing bugs for a few years? That doesn't sound right. Artificer will let you do that, giving you two cantrips, like Shocking Grasp to deal 2d8 lightning damage with a melee spell attack and prevent creatures from taking reactions, which should really swat the flies. Poison Spray forces a constitution saving throw on a creature, dealing 2d12 poison damage to those that fail. If you'd rather just gas the bugs, then zap them. For your first level spells, Long Strider adds 10 feet to a creature's movement speed to scurry around a little faster, and Jump triples a creature's jump distance, which will help you make up for your low strength score by pointing your Bug Blaster at the ground. Unfortunately, this does not apply to your hop, because a hop is not a jump. Never mind, they changed to Rengon. I think a hop is a jump. You're also a magical tinkerer, letting you put tiny magical effects into tiny non-magical items, a little message or static visual image, little flavor stuff. Second level artificers get infusions, little infusions to help you bust the bugs a little bit better. Like enhanced arcane focus, adding one to the attack rolls with a spell casting focus, and you can ignore up to half cover to swap bugs around corners. Goggles of nightly you see in the dark with your bad rabbit eyes, I think that's what your goggles are for. Sending stones makes them walkie-talkies that let you cast sending between them to communicate with creatures on the same plane that aren't in alternate realities. For you, that's Ratchet and Clank. A bag of holding will let you hold all the extra precursor orbs since it's the same size as a normal bag, but it can store up to 64 cubic feet of stuff. Third level artificers can choose a specialty, like Artillerist, to beep up your bug blaster with an Eldritch Cannon, which can be a Force Ballista that fires a ranged spell attack dealing 2d8 force damage and pushes the target back 5 feet to get an Ultrasonic Blaster. Could be a Flamethrower, forcing a Dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 15-foot cone, dealing 2d8 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed, who knew the poison has been flammable the whole time. You could also use it to give temporary HP equal to 1 plus your intelligence modifier to creatures within 10 feet of it. That's pretty useful for Jack when you're on his back. Fourth level artificers get another ability score improvement, cap off your dexterity, and then start working on your intelligence modifier for better bug killing stuff. Not that bugs are all that hard to kill anyway. We'll bounce back over to rogue now. Fifth level rogues get uncanny dodge, letting you take half damage as a reaction when you can see the source of damage. There's a lot of Looney Tunes shenanigans you bring to the table that feels a bit out of place once the games get edgy, but you can also deal 3d6 sneak attack damage. Maybe try using that. I feel like stabbing someone in the Achilles is much more in character with Jack 2 and Jack 3's vibes. Six level rogues get expertise in two more skills, letting you use them for sleight of hand and deception. You're not exactly an honorable guy. Seventh level rogues get evasion, letting you take half damage on failed deck saves and no damage on successful ones. With your rabbit stuff and a capped modifier, you could basically stand in a fireball without worry. You also get 4d6 sneak attack damage that you won't use. Eighth level rogues get another ability score improvement, use that on your intelligence since you have that extermination equipment. Not really outside of the spin-off game, but I think it could have been useful. Ninth level thieves get Supreme Sneak, letting you give yourself advantage on stealth checks if you've moved no more than half your movement speed in a round. If you pop Longstrider, that'll give you base 40, so you can still move 20 at a stealthy pace. Not that it really matters though, you have expertise with plus 15 to your stealth checks, so I'm not totally sure you need advantage. Tenth level rogues get another ability score improvement. We can't quite finish off your intelligence, but you can come pretty close. I like that rogues get an extra ability score here. It's weird and quirky. They're not like other classes. 11th level rogues get reliable talent, meaning the lowest you can roll on a skill you're proficient with is a 10 and you still get to add the modifier. With expertise in 4 skills, proficiency, and a whole bunch more, this is one of the best abilities a rogue gets. So is 6d6 sneak attack damage, are you sure you don't want to use that? 12th level rogues get another ability score improvement, or feat. We'll grab the skill expert feat, cap off your intelligence, grab another skill proficiency, like investigation, to find where those bugs are hiding, and expertise in another skill, like performance, to be more popular at the bar, only focusing on the important things at total level 16. 13th level thieves get to use magical devices, ignoring all class, race, and level requirements for magical items to use all the funky precursor tech. I don't know what the precursors were,
were, but I'm pretty sure they weren't Otzels. You also get 76 sneak attack damage. 14th level rogues get, that was a joke. I know the precursors were Otzels. That's the joke. Stop typing. 14th level rogues get blind sense, letting you know the location of any invisible or hidden creature within 10 feet of you. Considering your main fighting technique is just spinning your arms in a circle. I think that checks out. You can still hit people without looking. 15th level rogues get slippery mind, giving you proficiency with wisdom saving throws, which can be really great against things like hold person and charm person. You're the one who charms, you little charmer, and nobody is holding you if you don't want them to. Just like you're not using 8d6 sneak attack damage if you don't want to. Our capstone is the 16th level of rogue. For one last ability score improvement, grab the mobile feet for an extra 10 feet of movement speed. Creatures you attack can't make opportunity attacks against you that round, and you can ignore difficult terrain while dashing. Pairing this with cunning action, you can basically dash for free over the craggliest of rocks, then get 100 feet away if you've popped Longstrider. Longstrider's good. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you're sneaky. With plus 17 stealth checks, advantage on those checks if you only move 20 feet in a round or 25 with Longstrider, and a minimum roll of 27 thanks to reliable talent. You also have a ton of mobility with extra speed, the ability to move up walls, and dash as a bonus action so you can be wherever you want to be. Finally, you have a ton of skills with expertise in five of them to get things done out of combat, which is good because if you're not using sneak attack in combat, you're pretty terrible at fighting. That's purely a flavor choice though, and it's a really bad flavor choice. You also have really low HP, so if someone does find you, they could break you pretty quickly. Finally, you're small, so you could end up getting shoved around a bit, but that's why you have your trusty mount. Whether you want to put the team on your back in combat or be a motor mouth getting things done with roleplay, Jack and Daxter are a nice pair to be reckoned with. Just make sure you're using your powers to save the world. It's always nice when the heroes are eco-friendly. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, subscribe for more. We're making double videos every day this month. Join the Patreon for these feats and a bunch more, and sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.